Christmas isn't really about snow and lights and chimneys and presents. It's not about malls and movies and bells and sleighs. It's not about cards and carols and candy and cheer. Christmas is about a king. A king who became a baby and a baby who became a savior. Christmas is about a light that shatters the darkness and begins a new day. Christmas is about a gift, not a toy wrapped in paper, but a savior swaddled in a manger. Christmas is about a home, the savior leaving his so we could have one forever. Christmas is about the creator who entered into creation and shared in our humanity, but never our depravity. Christmas is about a cross because there's no heaven without Calvary and no Calvary without Bethlehem. Christmas is about Jesus. He's the reason for the season and every season and every day, hour, and moment. Christmas is about you. Because while it's true that Christ came into the world for you, don't forget that you came into the world for Christ. Welcome to Treasure Lake Church. It is good for us to reflect on what Christmas is about about a Savior who comes and makes his home with us, about a future that we have in which we will be with him in his home. Christmas is about an opportunity for us to draw near to God Almighty because the Savior has come and he will not relent until he has procured salvation and forgiveness for me and for you. Christmas is an awesome, awesome time. And I'm glad that we can spend this time together, that we can seek God, praise his name, and come to him with our prayer requests and praises. We thank God for how he's working in our lives. We're thankful that he's transforming us to be more like Jesus so that we would have more love and more faith, that we would hold on to hope, that we would pursue truth and care about it, that we would be the dads we should be, the mothers that we long to be, the kids that follow the Lord and follow the instruction of God as it comes to us through our, our parents. We are so glad that he's transforming us. Today as we pray, there's uh, people who would be very happy for us to be joining them in prayer. Tom Haynes has shared that he has a relative by the name of Irene that has upcoming brain surgery in a couple weeks. We're praying for her. Lisa Buckwitz, come next week, we'll have a surgery on her gallbladder. Angel wanted to have uh, some work done on his knees, and that was postponed until January. He has plenty of painful steps until that takes place. I want to ask that God strengthens Randall and Dale Smith and uh, give Sonia a wonderful procedure. We have a good number of people who are suffering from cancer, and we have all of us who need to love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And we need his help even to do that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as we reflect on uh, what Christmas is about, there is a smile that comes to our face for there is a redeemer who showed up. And he came to do all that was required so that the plan of the Father would be fulfilled and that salvation would be extended to us. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you that your spirit lives in us, that coaches us, that you desire for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control to be the outworking of your presence in our lives. We ask that that would take place and teach us, Father. Show us when we're not getting that right and, and show us, Father, how it is that we can take steps in faith so that we live like that. Father, I thank you very much that you care about this church and we pray that we would be people who love your word very much put it in practice, and uh, we say, Father, uh, show us how we can be more and more faithful to what you've already revealed. God, we pray that we'd be a group of people who love each other, who care about each other, and who labor together that your kingdom would come and that people would see how Jesus makes a difference. God, may each one of us be a bright light and a star in the darkness of night. We ask this in the name of Christ our Lord. We pray, Father, that you would bless those who have gone out from among us. There are people who are working in countries like Kosovo, and they are ministering to folk that uh, are part of a closed country of Nepal. Lord, there are individuals who are thinking about people groups that uh, don't speak the primary language, and they're working on the gospel getting to them. We ask that you bless them in their work, and may all know about Jesus, our Savior. 
Lord, I pray that you give uh, Angel good days and courageous days as he's waiting for his surgery, and we pray that it would go well. We ask that uh, you would strengthen Sonia Fetterhoff for her upcoming procedure. We pray that Irene's upcoming um, work with brain surgery, that it would go incredibly well by your grace. Lord, we ask that Lisa's surgery would go very well, and we pray that Darlene's vertigo that you would remove. We ask that you would bless Beth and Eleanor, Brad and Denise, Dave and Pam, Alex's mom, Todd and Tony, George, Gabby and Carolyn, and remove cancer from them. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would work in us on this day, that we would hear your word and that we would rejoice and that we would find ourselves marveling again that you sent us the only Savior who could ever fully save us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are so unique. I pray that we celebrate that well this December. These things we pray in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen.
Hey church family! Do you have anyone in your family who counts down, counts the days until Christmas? Can they tell you precisely if there are 22 or 23 days to go? And when you hear the number, what does it do to you? Are you concerned that there's not enough time to get it all done? Are you excited that the big celebration will soon be here? It can go either way, but wouldn't it be nice if this year the excitement built? It can. If we look closely at our Savior and adore Him, we will number the days with pleasure. His celebration is coming. Tuesday, December 5th is our blood drive. There are people right here in our community who depend on the generosity of others. Come between one and six to give the gifts of life. Friday, December 16th, TLC is having its family Christmas breakfast. This is for all ages. The kids are gonna have big smiles as they load up their plates. We'll sing a few carols and prepare our hearts for Christmas. And it's gonna be Miss Judy in the kitchen that morning. So plenty of us know what that means. It'll be great. That's Saturday, December 16th at 9 a.m. The children of TLC are preparing a treat for us on Christmas Eve. They will have a special presentation at our four o'clock service. Would you like for your kids to be involved or grandchild? You can sign them up at the Welcome Center. The presentation will involve pre-K to fourth graders, practices on Mondays at six to seven. As you walked into the Welcome Center, you saw that our angel tree was lit and filled with tags. Each tag is connected to a child or a family right here in the area. For many, recent days have been challenging. The tags on the tree provide a way for us to be a blessing for those in need. Take a tag or two and write your name on the clipboard indicating which ones you took. You'll find on each tag information about what a family needs or what a child is wishing for this year. Be sure to attach the tag to the gift and bring it back to TLC by December 17th and you will help make this a special Christmas. Please put the items in an open gift bag so that we can add a little something special as well. Our young family group meets this Sunday on December 3rd at 5. Get Fed this Wednesday starts with dinner at 5.30 and Bible studies at 6. The following Wednesday the 13th, we're going Christmas caroling. You gotta see the big smiles when people open their doors and hear the music they love. This Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday We'll have two special Christmas Eve services that afternoon at four and at six. Sometimes God gives us a special treat. Our youth had a super time at Reverb. We thought we'd give you a little taste of all that went on. I am Chase Clark, so I went to Reverb. The guy talked about Jesus and how it could affect your life and um, he got to, we actually got a chance to go up to about like where the bathrooms are and someone talked to us and it, like I really connected with Jesus, felt like he like loved me, loved me, loved me. first time with us, thanks for being here. We welcome you. Please find the welcome card in the pew in front of you, fill it out, and leave it in the basket by the sanctuary doors on your way out. We are working our way through a series, The Miraculous Births of the Bible.
Because God Almighty at various times, he decided to do what no one could do. A child came. It was a special child. And at each point, God was showing his power and how the life of a miraculous child could touch many people. All of that was leading forward to the time in which the most miraculous birth would take place, when God would send his son, his one and only son, to be with us. As you work through these miraculous births, we are preparing ourselves for the celebration of Christmas and discerning how these miraculous births are signposts on the way, telling us that God has something even greater in store for us. I, uh, I found myself to uh, be expecting something different Well, I'm referring back to a time I'm the youngest of four in my family, and what was true about me is I was always behind my siblings, and so they would be doing math that I didn't comprehend, and they'd be reading books that were beyond my reading level, and they would say things like, Dave, you're really going to like it when you get to this book because it's so good, and I remember the first time that I picked up uh, the books, the Lord of the Rings series. I did so because my brother and sister said it had been so good, and as I was reading through that series, I had an expectation, and my expectation was since Tolkien was a Christian writer, like C.S. Lewis was, I, I thought that Since C.S. Lewis put a clear Christ figure into his stories on the Chronicles of Narnia, I was expecting for J.R. Tolkien to do the same. And as I was reading through the epic story of Middle Earth, I kept waiting for the Christ figure to appear who would conquer Sauron. And I expected for a long time for that figure to be the character of Gandalf, and it wasn't. I think I read 900 pages of Tolkien, expecting for Gandalf to be and become something more than he was. It never happened, and I found myself to be very disappointed. Well, today we're turning our attention to a hero in the Old Testament. Uh, We love his name, his name of Samson. And as we read the story, I think that we can find ourselves actually bumping into a huge disappointment. For while Samson had some momentary highs, and it's worthy of celebrating those occasions, I I think that lest we make the mistake that I made with Gandalf, we need to confess right from the very beginning that this is a hero who was deeply, deeply flawed. We don't really like the idea of a hero who's deeply flawed. In fact, it may be confusing to us, but on this occasion, it just might be the case that The confusion that we have as we analyze the life of Samson, it actually might have for us the greatest primary theological truth of the story. We're going to see if we get there. Today, as we are thinking about Samson, what we want to say is this. Samson is no Christ figure in the Old Testament. In fact, I think that we could say it's really hard to find a Christ figure in the Old Testament because Jesus would come and be so much more than any single person ever was. I'm not quite sure that anyone ever really foreshadowed who he would would be to an adequate level. But what we see in Samson is this great truth is that God, he can deliver, God is. He can save, and God can even use a person like Samson to save people, even though we will desperately need someone who is far, far more than Samson if we are to be saved. And so in thinking about this miraculous birth, we find ourselves turning to the book of Judges chapter 13 today, and the story begins with these words. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Uh, This story begins on a very sad note. I, I think I could say that it's doubly sad. I mean, not only have this group of people been delivered into the hands of the Philistines, their enemies, um... The reason why they're in the Philistines' hands is, uh, the Israelites, they've done this to themselves. The text clarified, they have done evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they're reaping the natural consequences of walking away from him. They are sleeping in the bed that they have made, and this has been going on and on. It is dragging on for 40 years, living with the consequences of walking away from the Lord. I think that uh, we could analyze our own lives and say, you know, I, I know something about this. I, 
I know the consequences of walking away from the Lord, and I, I know how that has created pain and agony in my life. And, and on this occasion, we have an entire people group that is suffering because of that. But what we find in the book of Judges is this. God has this wonderful pattern. <clears throat> As the people veer off and go in a way that they shouldn't, God raises up a judge. And this judge comes and he calls the people back in line. And during the years of that judge, they follow him. And when the judge passes away, the people, they, they migrate back to where they, they once were. It says something about the heart of man being deceitful and how we don't follow the Lord very well. And God would raise up another judge. And, and this has been going on and on. And so now, since 40 years have passed and the people are in the hands of the Philistines and they're doing it because they're there because they have not obeyed the Lord and they've done evil in his eyes, the expectation that we have is, so God, who's it going to be? Who are you going to raise up to be a judge? Now, 11 times previous, God has raised up a judge to call the people back. And now, on the 12th time, he is going to do something that he has never done before. On this 12th time, God is not going to look across the nation of Israel and analyze the adults that are there and to choose someone who perhaps because of his experience or because of her character becomes the judge. On this occasion, God is going to surprise Israel because he will choose someone who hasn't been born yet. And as we read the story, it's interesting that there is a threat that this person actually never will be born. And that's part of the mystery of the story. And the story is read this way. You see a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. Now our hearts go out to Manoah and his wife. If they were a typical family, they would have been looking forward to having children. I think they grew up in a culture in which it was extraordinarily important to have a growing family. Their culture really didn't have a, a whole lot of reasons to put off and delay childbearing. And so people started families fairly quickly. And by the time we enter into the story, there is ample evidence for Manoah and his wife that uh, they're just not having kids. By the time we enter this story, not only do Manoah and his wife know this, their immediately, immediate family knows this, their neighbors know this, there is a foregone conclusion that the typical family planning track just isn't going to be working for this couple, and our hearts go out to them. And that's when God Almighty intervenes in verse 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to her, that is Manoah's wife, and said, You are barren and childless, but you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Now, for those of you who were with us last week, I think you're going to say, Hey, something here sounds very familiar. You see, last week, God Almighty showed up to a family that was barren and childless. He showed up to Abraham and Sarah and came with an announcement that they would be expecting a child. Now, notice what the text says here. It says that the angel of the Lord appeared to her. And as the angel of the Lord appears to her, he's going to say, Hey, I want you to know that it's clear to me that uh, you're not having kids. In fact, I've actually chosen you. This isn't coincidental. I've chosen you for this very reason. Had God wanted a family that already had kids, he just could have walked a little bit further down the street and chosen another one. He chooses a family that is not having kids and says, uh, I have a big announcement for you. You will have a child. He will be a boy, and I have great plans for him. Now, what the text said, if you look at the very first line, it says that the angel of the Lord appeared to her. Now, that phrase, angel of the Lord, is very loaded, and the word angel literally means messenger. I, I think that we might do well to actually say, and the messenger of the Lord appeared to her, because I don't think that as we read this story, we're going to conclude that this is a typical angel. This isn't a Gabriel kind of uh, entity that shows up. I think that as we read this story, we're going to say, this looks a whole lot more like an angel and we will have reason to say, I wonder if this was not a Christophany. In other words, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, shows up and has a conversation with Manoah's wife and with Manoah. I think that the text will give us evidence to suspect that this is actually 
Jesus who is there, but let's piece together this story that we have in front of us. It sort of goes like this. The children of Israel, they've been having a particularly rotten time for 40 years. During all the days of her life, Manoah's wife has been living in this rotten time period, and she's had an extra burden to bear because she's not having kids, which would have been one of the desires of her heart. And now, at this very moment, God Almighty is going to do something. God Almighty is going to act, and he is going to take it upon himself, the task of giving to this people who has been languishing for 40 years a deliverer which they absolutely need and We want to read the interesting instructions that were given to Manoah's wife when the promise of this child came. Verse 4, so the angel of the Lord, this messenger, says, Now see to it that you drink no wine or other fermented drink and that you do not eat anything unclean. You will become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. Dedicated to God from the womb, he will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now, I think that when we read these words, we go, wow, this is kind of interesting. To accompany the announcement of a birth, uh, this woman is given some dietary restrictions. That sounds a little bit odd. What is the meaning of that? And, And the meaning really comes to us when the angel said, this boy is to be a Nazarite. Well, the Nazarite vow was part of what God gave Moses when he gave him all of the law. Part of the package of the law is this, is that some people would choose voluntarily to make a commitment to God Almighty. And in the midst of that commitment, there were three requirements that they were to fulfill. They were to avoid grapes and wine, they would not touch any dead bodies, and they would not cut their hair. This was something that people would get involved in. They'd do it specially for the Lord, and people did it throughout the ages. Even centuries later, the Apostle Paul would end up taking a Nazarite vow, but but this particular expression of the Nazarite vow was unlike any other that had ever happened, and It started this way. You see, a Nazarite vow was always a voluntary commitment that you made. But the angel of the Lord is declaring that rather than this child growing up and deciding whether he'd like to take a Nazarite vow, this child is to live as a Nazarite, and it's sort of obligatory by God Almighty. And not only that, in order that the child would be a pure Nazarite, well, mom is going to have to hop into the program because while the child is in mother's womb, mom is going to have to fulfill the commitment of the Nazarite vow so that this child from conception throughout all of their life will be dedicated to the Lord as a Nazarite. And uh, if you're wondering, has any other sort of scenario been created like that when a child before it's conceived is set aside to be a Nazarite? No, this is different. We haven't seen this one before, and therefore we can think and believe that there must be some grand reason why. And the reason is declared right from the onset. And there's great expectation attached to this child for this child will lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistine. This child will be a deliverer. This is predetermined. Before he can suck his thumb, before he can speak a word, it is declared he is born for a purpose that he will deliver his people. And therefore, we find this wonderful truth in the announcement of the birth of Samson. That God will save his people through the coming of a child who is not only different, but he will be miraculous. And that is a theme that we will see over and over again in these miraculous births. We will celebrate it time and time again as God is preparing to send us ultimately the one who is completely miraculous, who will save us all from our sins. So what is Manoah's wife going to do now that she has heard this information Well, then the woman, Manoah's wife, went to her husband and told him, a man of God came to me. He looked like an angel of God, very awesome. I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name, but he said to me, you will become pregnant and have a son. Now, if you would consider this moment, it's such an interesting 
little context, we have a woman who cannot have a child, who's been told that she will expect a child by a messenger of God, and therefore the child's birth will be miraculous. I think that's a theme that we've bumped into, well, last week. We had Abraham and Sarah who were wrestling with the news given to them by God Almighty that a miraculous child is on the way and there will be blessings that come through this miraculous child. Today, we have Manoah and his wife who are wrestling with the news of a miraculous child who is on its way. We know that in December that typically we talk about Mary and Joseph as they find themselves wrestling with the news of a miraculous child who is on his way. And with each one of these children, God is doing something. With Abraham and Sarah, he is saying, there will be a people that will be more numerous than the stars of the sky, but it will all start miraculously by my hand. With Manoah and his wife, God says, there will be deliverance that will come to this people, but it will not be by your strength, it will be by mine. And with Mary and Joseph, he will be declaring, and there will be salvation that will come. It will not be by your strength, it will be by mine we find this great theme. And so Manoah has a few things that he's thinking about. And this husband who now knows that he's going to have a child, he prays to the Lord God Almighty and he says, pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. And God heard Manoah. And the angel came again to the woman while she was out in the field, but her husband Manoah was not with her. Now, when I read the story of Manoah and his wife, I I find that there is much to commend in them, for when they heard that they were expecting, uh, neither one of them laughed. They simply took it by faith that God is going to do something extraordinary. And we see from Manoah's request that knowing that God will do something extraordinary, his question is, so... How am I going to raise an extraordinary kid? What am I going to do as a dad? And how are we going to parent him? And Lord, could you, send that, could you send that messenger back so that we know how to raise your exceptional child? I think that we see in Manoah a wonderful example. Um, he understands that the task of parenting is uh, rather complex. And even before the child comes, he says, <clears throat> I would like to know how to raise this child. There's a few things that we can learn from Manoah. And God sends the messenger, this angel, back again. And here's how the text continues in verse 10. And then the woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. And Manoah got up and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, that means when the boy is born, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? Now, I think that what Manoah is trying to say is, can you tell me more about this child? Can you tell me what he's going to do and what we as parents need to have in our minds in order to raise him? How am I going to raise him? What's his rule and work? I, I kind of want to have a head start on this. And the interesting thing is, is that the the messenger of God basically doesn't add anything to what he's already told Manoah's wife. Um, your son will be dedicated to God. He will fulfill a Nazarite vow all the days of his life. Therefore, there's three things that I want you and your wife to work with with this child. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, he doesn't eat grapes, doesn't drink wine, doesn't come in contact with dead bodies, and he doesn't cut his hair. He kind of leaves it really simple. Um, Manoah, these are the three things that I'm asking you to do. I'm not adding to the list. I'm going to keep it rather simple. I find that to be intriguing, and it's an interesting goal that Samson has as he grows up. But with that being said, uh, Manoah then made a suggestion. So Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, we would like for you to stay until we prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord replied, even though you detain me, I will not eat any of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to the Lord. And Manoah did not realize that it was the angel of the Lord. 
Now, in this text, Manoah is being polite. He feels like he is in the presence of some distinguished guests, and so he wants to offer them the very best that he has, and he suggests that he prepares a goat for them. And the reaction of the messenger is rather odd. Uh, Manoah said, I'd like to make you lunch. And the alternative that the messenger gives is like, how about we forego lunch? And instead of that, how about if you make an offering to the Lord? And how about if we worship him together? Now, I don't know about you, but that is a very interesting alternative to what was recommended by Manoah want to see if we could try this on for size let's suppose that you met someone and uh, you gave an invitation for the two of you to get together for lunch and after you've said you know hey could we meet maybe it's going to be at Perkins or something the person that you just invited looks back at you and says well you know I've got a different idea how about if we get together we worship the Lord sing a few songs and you cut out a check for God's work in Bulgaria how about if we do that I think that if somebody said that, we would be surprised and would say, hey, I'm just inviting you to lunch. Is there any problem with lunch? It's a strange alternative for this messenger to give to Manoah. And I wonder if the alternative is not pointing to us the truth that this messenger is unlike any other messenger that has set foot in Manoah's town ever. It is appropriate because this messenger has arrived for there to be a sacrifice made to God Almighty. That is how he is directing Manoah. And so Manoah had a few other questions for this interesting messenger of God. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, what is your name so that we may honor you when your word comes true? But the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? Now, I want to mention that I have here what I believe is the best translation of verse 18. My name is wonderful. I think that that is the best way to render what the messenger said at that point in time. You have someone whose name is wonderful. Well, I think that someone's name being wonderful might be a little hard for us to wrap our hands around it, but perhaps Brad and Landy, Lanny Waldrop have already helped us with this. You see... They have introduced or sung oftentimes a song here, which is called I Stand in Awe. And the lyrics of that song are really capturing the notion of what wonderful means. And here are the lyrics of that song. They go like this. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Those last three lines are really unpacking the notion of wonderful. When something is wonderful in the way that is written in this text, it is beyond words, it is beyond comprehension, it is like nothing that is ever seen or heard. That is a very interesting name. My name is wonderful, it is beyond words, it is beyond comprehension. And I, I think that Manoah could have answered to this interesting guest who's there, hey, you know, I... I was just really looking for the name that your mama called you. That's all I really want. I just wanted to keep it simple. And if Manoah had asked that question, I think that the messenger standing in front of him would have said, well, that never happened to me. I never had a mother. I was never born. My name is Wonderful. And that name Wonderful appears later in the text in the book of Isaiah, and it's associated with none other than the Messiah, for here is a prediction of the Messiah. For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called, here it is, Wonderful Counselor, beyond description, beyond the words that we have, beyond comprehension, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the name that the messenger uses, a name which is reserved for none other than the Messiah himself. I have a feeling that the one who was standing in front of him was too marvelous for words, beyond comprehension and like nothing that had ever been seen or heard. And therefore, my question for you is this, who do you think was standing in front of him? Who do you think had come with this particular piece of information? I think that the text tells us that it was far more than any ordinary angel, if you could call an angel something like that. 
And Manoah was faithful. He went with the alternative that the guests suggested. Then Manoah took the young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on the rock to the Lord. The Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched. As the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven, the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground, and when the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was indeed the angel of the Lord. The visitor went up in a swirling plume of fire and flame and disappeared into heaven that is unlike any visitor that we would ever expect and when we start to put all of these details together I think that this is what we see first of all that visitor came with a prediction you who have no ability to have children you will have a child something miraculous will happen in you I showed up to tell you that As you wanted to honor me, I redirected you for that we wouldn't have lunch. Instead, we would sacrifice to God Almighty because that pleases me more than anything else. My name is Wonderful, a name that's reserved only for the Messiah. And then this individual ascends in the flames up to the sky, out of view. And Manoah and his wife, they draw the conclusion, oh, this is no ordinary visitor. I believe that God came and he informed them of what he would do, a miracle. And that miracle takes place in verse 24. And the woman gave birth to a boy and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him while he was in Mahina, Dan, between Zorah and Eshtol. God Almighty began to work in this individual of Samson. And the work that he did, it's just exceptional. Can you imagine this? One quarter of the text about Samuel's life is just talking about what takes place before he's even born. That is not typical. We don't get that about David the king. We don't get that about Jeremiah the prophet. There is something exceptional about Samuel and about Samson. And Samson comes with a specific task. He is to become a deliverer. And he will be a deliverer in as much as the Spirit of God moves in him. And only as the Spirit of God moves in him will we find the high moments of his life. That phrase, the Spirit of God was on him. It shows up in chapter 13, verse 25, chapter 14, verse 6, 14, 19, 15, 14, 16, 20. It is when God is at work in this man's life that deliverance comes. It is when the Spirit of God is is on him. And apart from those times, the story of Samson is really the story of someone who is deeply, deeply flawed. Samson comes across as a playboy. Samson is a person whose eye strays far from home. Samson is a person who, during most of his life, had already compromised two of the three requirements of the Nazarite vow, and then later on with Delilah, the third will be compromised as well. Samson is an interesting judge because he's no model of devotion. Samson comes with his strength, and he doesn't necessarily lead the people back to God. Samson is a deeply flawed individual and only has a few high points when the Spirit of God Almighty works in him. Samson is the kind of guy that a dad would think twice before he would give his son a shirt that says Samson on it. That's how flawed this person was. And the question is, so what gives Why would God send us a deliverer who was so deeply flawed? Wouldn't it have been a whole lot better if we got a deliverer who, well, paralleled a little bit better who Jesus was? Wouldn't that have been a better decision on God's part? And I think that the answer that we need to look at as we have these questions in our minds, the answer is this. You see, uh, Samson was who he was because despite the fact that he had a miraculous birth, He was born with a sinful nature. And it's an interesting thing what the sinful nature does. The sinful nature causes us to rebel against God's rules and laws. It causes us to seek what is best for ourselves. And 
what we find when people are famous and when they're exceptional is they use all the benefits that they have from their fame and their exceptionalism just to, well, to provide more pleasure for themselves. That is what Samuel did, Samson did. And the funny thing about Samson is the way I see it, I look at these requirements that he was given and uh, they look to me like they weren't that tough. I mean, he's got three things he needs to do. So, so Samson, you will be the deliverer of your people. I'm just asking you these three things. Could, could you avoid grapes and wine? Could you avoid dead animals and would you not cut your hair? I don't know. If somebody served that up to me and said uh, you could be the deliverer of a people if you were to do that, it would seem to me it would be a pretty good deal. But the truth is, is that the sinful nature of God re- of man rebels against all of those rules and Samson rebelled and demonstrated that he was a deeply flawed individual. And I think that what we learn from Samson, which is really the takeaway, is this. A miraculous birth in and of itself is not going to be sufficient for deliverance to come to God's people. It's going to take more than a miraculous birth. It's going to need to be a miraculous birth that comes with a miraculous person. For someone to come and to redeem God's people, it's going to take more than superhuman strength. It is going to take divine strength. For someone to come and to provide salvation that everyone needs, it can't just be one of us. I mean, God gave us one of us, supercharged in Samson, and look what he did because of his sinful nature. God will send someone who's different, who is of a different nature, who has no sinful nature, and he will be the one who will stand up for us, and he will be the deliverer that we need. Samson is but a shadow, a poor shadow of the redemption that will come with God Almighty. We are looking for someone who comes with more than a miraculous birth. We are looking for someone who comes with a miraculous nature. And God Almighty, he will send us that one. For one is coming who will conquer the enemy all by himself. And one is coming who will restore the people of Israel and he will lead them back to God. One is coming who will not only have a miraculous birth, he will be miraculous in that he is God's son, God's only begotten son. And this one who comes, he will be unstoppable. For death cannot hold its prey. Jesus, my Savior, he tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. And so as we approach this wonderful time of Christmas, looking at the signposts of the miraculous births that led up to the coming of Christ, what we see is this, as we approach an occasion in which we will celebrate a miraculous birth. And we will celebrate a miraculous nature. And we will celebrate a divine plan. And we will celebrate a perfect sacrifice. For Jesus comes and he is like no other. He is not just a little different from Samuel. He is completely different than Samuel. He is the only Savior who could save us fully from our sins. He is God's Son. And He will come through a miraculous birth. And He will redeem His people from His sins. Samson, Isaac, the others that we will look look to... They are signposts along the way that God, by his power and strength, will do something miraculous that only he can do. And only he can save his people from their sins. And we will watch his arrival come miraculously on Bethlehem morn. Father God, I thank you for the story of Samson. It is so intriguing to see someone who has a miraculous birth, but but grows up with a sinful nature. It's so discouraging and disheartening to see the way that he, um, he misused his opportunity to be a grand deliverer for his people, but he did not overcome his own appetites. Lord, it makes us thankful that you didn't just send us a miraculous birth. You sent us a miraculous one when your one and only son, your only begotten son, Jesus, came to be the Savior of the world. And we thank you that his miraculous birth combined with his miraculous life 
provides for us the salvation that we need so that we can truly be delivered and can be close to you. Lord, we look forward to celebrating very well this month the coming of the one who is so different. Jesus, may you be praised, may you be celebrated. There is none like you, and we worship you and you alone. These things we pray in the name of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. First Sunday of the month, there's something that we, we want to do. As the Lord says, do this in remembrance of me, we come and we say, Lord, I count it a privilege that we get a chance to take part in the observance of the Lord's Supper, communion, and we do what Jesus said to remember him. Maybe as we're getting close to the Christmas season, it's uh, fascinating for us to realize that as this child grew, he was rather aware of what he was heading to. All the days of his life, he understood that he needed to be in his father's house, and he understood that he would be the sacrifice for the world, and he was willing to live that life looking toward that moment, saying, I will do this for all of you, for the only way whereby we could be saved is through him, for we needed more than someone with a miraculous birth the way that Samson had and the way that Isaac had. We would need someone who would stand in our stead, who was of a different nature, that he would have no sin that he would have to have atoned for on his own. He would be the perfect sacrifice, Lamb of God. There's only one who ever fulfilled that. His name is Jesus. And we pause now to remember how awesome and spectacular this Jesus is. The Apostle Paul wrote this, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we pause and we say, we, we know what this bread symbolizes. It symbolizes that uh, Jesus went to the cross and that it would be a cruel way to die. And he would do so for us. And we pause and we remember that all the days of his life he saw this coming and he decided that he would do that in, in order that God would be honored and that we would be saved. So Jesus, we pause and we thank you for your most incredible gift. You were the only candidate that could do this. And so we are amazed that you have done it for us. It shows us your love at a level that we will always attempt to grasp. May you be praised, Jesus, for what you have done. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The body of Christ which is broken for you, take and eat. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we pause to remember the one who was fulfilling a plan that started out in a place called Bethlehem in a manger, a plan that would have him walking through the streets of Caesarea and proclaiming the gospel on hillsides, a plan that would have him confronting the demoniac and having people reject him, and he did it for us due to his great love. And we understand that the plan took him all the way to the cross, essential that his blood would be spilled. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We are sinful and we need his forgiveness. Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave all, and thank you that uh, by your blood shed on the cross, we find ourselves washed whiter than snow. We honor you. We adore you. We are so amazed that you are our Savior. We're blessed, and we want to bless you. May you be praised forever. Amen. The blood of Jesus, which is shed for you, take and drink. And the Apostle Paul says, as often as we do this, we celebrate something. We celebrate salvation through Jesus, the Lamb of God.